Hello everyone, uh, my name is Jean and today I'll be talking about why children matter through the perspective of developmental psychology. But before I start, uh, allow me to tell you a bit about myself and I'm going to do that by joining the dots backwards. Um, I'm currently a second year PhD candidate in psychology at the Center for Family Research. My supervisor is Professor Claire Hughes. I am part of the Radio or Not research study team which I will talk more about later on. I obtained my undergraduate degree, which was a Bachelor's of Art in Psychology at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor in the United States. And for my thesis, I examined um, effortful control training in clinically anxious preschool children. And for my master's in clinical psychology, also at the University of Michigan, uh, I looked at Malaysian mother's ethno theories of maladaptive behavior in preschool children. So if you haven't already guessed, I am Malaysian born and raised. And before I started college, I actually worked in a child development center and as a paraprofessional autism aide um, for a year or so to earn some money before I started college. And another thing about myself is that I am a first generation college student, meaning that both my parents um, weren't able to afford to go to college. And so my sisters and I are the first in our family history uh, to have entered higher education. And I decided to take it all the way to a PhD where I am now. So a brief overview of what we'll do today uh, in today's lecture, I'll give, uh, I'll discuss some historical and theoretical perspectives relating to children's roles in developmental psychology. I'll talk about the research that I'm currently doing with a focus on the methods that I'll be using and how that relates to the overarching theme of our lecture today. So um, we'll be using Mentimeter and I'm going to share my screen and if people could try and see if they could access this. So on your laptops or your phones or anything like that, if you go to menti.com and if you use the code 1821, the code that's right up here, 2288, are people able to see the options that you can use and put in your votes? I have one vote. All right, so the question is, if you had to choose, um, would you choose to stay in a country that's hot all year round, like Malaysia, where um, the coldest temperature is about 26 degrees on a good night, and uh, maybe up to 39 on a bad day? All right, so see the little penguins going up? Okay got 27 people who will be happy to come to Malaysia with me. Nine. All right, we'll keep going. I think we have about 100 over people here. So I'm going to put in a vote as well, just to, you know, up the ante. Right, we have a clear winner, obviously. Are people able to see the um, Scores going up. I hope you can. All right. So it seems to have sort of slowed down. So we have a clear winner. People won four seasons. Um, and that's menti.com. And we'll be using it one more time for an interactive task later on. Oh, it's still going up. Are people just voting twice. All right. There's, there's about 158 of us on the call. That, so, so there's lots of people okay. voting. Perfect. Yep, that's okay. It's a, it's a hard decision to make. Right. So going back to our lecture, um, there's this game. I'm not sure if anyone's played it before, but I used to play with my sisters when we went to the art museum. It's called Baby, like look for the baby. And basically what the game is, is you go to a museum and you try to look for uh, the baby. Right. And I'm not an art history major, um, and I recognize that it's a lot more nuanced than um, what I've probably been told. But I've, what I've been told from an art history major friend is that during a period of time, especially shortly after the Middle Ages, children were seen as little adults. So just smaller versions of fully grown adults. And this was reflected 
in the way that they were depicted in art. And so right now, I want people to think about what are three words that come to mind when you think about children. And if you go to menti.com, and if you key in the code 928, oh, sorry, that's not the code, is it? Let me give you the proper code. I do apologize. All right, there we go. All right, and if people key in this code, and if you could put in three words that come to mind when you think about children. All right, are people able to see a kind of word cloud going on? Okay. We've got small, innocent, I see annoying, influenceable. Right, James, I just want to make sure that you can see whatever I'm seeing. Yeah, right. yeah, okay. we, yeah, it's great. Great, okay. I was like, am I the only one enjoying this at the moment? <laughs> right, so we have quite a few people. Um, we have quite a few innocent, small, cute, playful, loud, and so on, open-minded, vulnerable, wonderless. Okay. All right, now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and it's going to keep going. And I'd be happy to share the word cloud with people after if they're keen on seeing where it's gotten to. I'm gonna go back to the lecture. So thanks everyone for um, participating in that. And so the words that came to mind were probably influenced by perhaps what you have heard over your life. It could be from your communities, it could be from your culture, um, from school or so on. So some key concepts or some key perceptions surrounding children, right, include things like children should be seen and not heard. That's very common in Asian cultures, um, such as mine. Another is that of tabula rasa, which is a Latin phrase um, that posits the theory that individuals are born without built-in mental content. So I think some people wrote innocent, right? Um, influenceable as well. Um, the idea that all knowledge comes from experiences or perception. And in Malaysia, a common one is bagai kain putih, which literally translates to like a blank piece of cloth or like a blank canvas. And so, how, how has all these ideas, how have these ideas might have been reflected in psychological research? So as you can see from the research titles, um, the effects of parenting on child outcomes have been extensively studied from decades ago. For example, the effects of father's involvement, the role of parents in children's educational outcomes, um, and so on. And this has not all been for nothing, of course, because there have been extremely comprehensive frameworks that have been garnered from these studies. So some example include uh, perhaps something that you might be, uh, you might have come across, um, which is attachment styles. So the idea that um, authoritarian and neglectful parenting were associated with insecure attachment in children. And also um, it's, this, this, I, this study of parents' influence has also expanded our knowledge of quite important aspects of child socialization. So for instance, enabling our understanding of the effects of harsh parenting on children and knowing that, that the outcomes can be quite negative. So clearly the driving role of parents of the driving role of parents in child development is a very well established one. And so now at this point, I'd like to stop here and ask everyone a question. And you don't have to answer in the chat, just try and think about it, okay? 
Can you remember the first decision you ever made? All right, so just think about it. Oh, I can, I'm able to see the chat. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Where someone is just like, nope. I mean, you can put it in the chat if you'd like. Um, but just, you know, sort of a reflective question of, of try, try and think back to the first decision you made. Okay. And perhaps it was something as simple as reaching out for one toy or the other. That's a decision, right? You see babies choosing between, do I go towards this, that? Um, maybe it was refusing to eat something. Right, and whatever it is, it's likely that you cannot recall the first decision you ever made in your life. And chances are, it's because you were too young to remember. So what does that tell us? It tells us that perhaps children are equally as capable, no matter how young, of being drivers in their own lives, whether or not they can remember it. And that realization emerged in researchers' acknowledgement of the child's agentic role in their own development and socialization processes, right? Now, and this one, you can put it in the chat if you like, and I take a look at it. Um, but what do you think all these images have in common? What's something that comes to mind when you look at these images that you think that they might share in common? Two people, two people, two people, interactions, two people, activities, mm -hmm. more than one person. Harmony, that's a nice one. Interactions, depends on someone else. Yeah, yeah. If you go and sit on the seesaw and you just sort of sit there, you can't really go up or down. Fun, fun. You need people to participate. Binary, partnership, stimulation. Enjoyment, play, interdependency. These are all really, 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 really good concepts and words. And I, I couldn't agree um, more that this is, the, the, they're all still coming in. So I'm just taking a look at them because they're all very interesting. Right. So yes, exactly. So this idea that child development isn't merely based on a unidirectional mechanism, right? There is bidirectionality to it. Maybe th there was this idea that perhaps children are part of a dyadic dance rather than being passive recipients of external forces, such as parenting, right? So now we'll discuss some theoretical frameworks, okay? So, Bell Seminole study in 1968 proposed that both parents and children are responsive to each other's behavior and show a pattern of constant reciprocal adaptation. And you see how subsequent frameworks begin to build on this, but you also note that it happens in a rather negative light. So I'll walk you through it. Patterson's coercion theory in 1982 stated that children with difficult temperament so prone to throwing tantrums, you know, being moody, they tended to elicit maladaptive parenting from their caregivers over time. So maladaptive parenting included things like harsh punishment, right, and corporal punishment, and so on. And it was this idea that there's a set of ongoing interactions between individuals that result in the modification of each individual's behavior. So you can see here that the parent directs the child, the child refuses, the parent increases demand, child argues back, and the parent backs off or gives up, and this reinforces the argumentative child. Samarov's transactional model, 1975, also proposed that the development of the child is a product of the continuous dynamic interactions of the child and the experience that's provided by his or her environment. So for instance, in this one, you can see it's quite similar to the one before, right? Where you have this back forth, back forth between two different parties. And in this case, they were looking at how the biochemical dysregulation of a depressed mother would confer a negative effect on the status of the neonate, resulting in a negative mood from the mother and then leading to avoidant attachment style, leading to family conflicts, 
poor social skill in the child, and so on. So Samarov's transactional model focused largely on how um, this bidirectionality predicted children's externalizing behavior, that is negative behaviors. Now, we're going to watch a video from a movie that I think some of you might have seen before. And I'm going to try and make sure that I share it properly. Um, so James, I'm going to try and share my screen again. And I'm going to try and make sure that people can hear it. All right. So, as it turns out, the green trash can is not recycling. It's for greens, like compost and eggshells. Mm. And the blue one is recycling. And the black one is... Riley is acting so weird. Why is she acting so weird? What do you expect? All the islands are down. Joy would know what to do. That's it. Until she gets back, we just do what Joy would do. Great idea. Anger, fear, disgust. How are we supposed to be happy? Hey, Riley. Good news. I found a junior hockey league right here in San Francisco. And get this, tryouts are tomorrow after school. What luck, right? Hockey. Uh-oh, what do we do? So, disgust. How are we supposed to be happy? Hey, Riley, I've got good news. I found a junior hockey league right here in San Francisco. And get this, tryouts are tomorrow after school. What luck, right? Hockey. Uh-oh, what do we do? Guys, uh, th th this, uh, here, you, you pretend to be joined. Wouldn't it be great to be back out on the ice? Oh, yeah, that sounds fantastic. What was that? That wasn't anything like joy. Uh, because I'm not joy? Yeah, no kidding. Did you guys pick up on that? Uh-huh. Sure. Okay, it. something's wrong. Should we ask her? Let's probe, but keep it subtle so she doesn't notice. So? How was the first day of school? She's probing us. I'm done. You pretend to be Joy. What? Okay. Um, hmm. It was fine, I guess. I don't know. Oh, very smooth. That was just like Joy. Something is definitely going on. She's never acted like this before. What should we do? We're going to find out what's happening, but we'll need support. Signal the husband. Ahem. <clears throat> Uh-oh, she's looking at us. Uh, what did she say? What? Oh, oh, sorry, sir. No one was listening. Is it garbage night? Uh, we left the toilet seat up. What? What is it, woman? What? <sighs> He's making that stupid face again. I could strangle him right now. Signal him again. Ah, so, Riley, how was school? Oh, oh, are you kidding me? Time. For this, we gave up that Brazilian helicopter pilot? Boo, I'll be joy. School was great, all right? Riley, is everything okay? <sighs> Sir, she just rolled her eyes at us. What is her deal? All right, make a show of force. I don't want to have to put the foot down. No, not the foot. Riley, I do not like this new attitude. Oh, I'll show you attitude, okay? No, 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 stay happy! What is your problem? Just leave me alone. Sir, reporting high levels of sass. Take it to DEFCON 2. You heard that, gentlemen? DEFCON 2. Listen, young lady, I don't know where this disrespectful attitude came from. You want a piece of this, Pops? Come and get it! Yeah, well, well... Here it comes. Prepare the foot. Keys to safety to position. Ready to launch on your command, sir. Just shut up! Fire! That's it. Go to your room. Now. Ah! The foot is down. The foot is down. Yeah! Good job, gentlemen. That could have been a disaster. Well, that was a disaster. Right. So, bearing in mind the models that we just looked at, right? how do you think you would explain what just happened in that video clip? So if you have a piece of paper um, in front of you and you maybe want to try and fill this out, I'm just thinking about Samarov's transactional model or Patterson's coercion theory. How would you explain to a developmental psychology perspective of bidirectionality what just happened in that clip between the child and the parent? So what would I say? I would say something like perhaps the child was already in a state of, you know, she, she was stressed out. And then when the mother probed her, right, that invoked a negative response. And then the father got involved 
and the father was already a bit frustrated at the mother and then it just proceeded to escalate resulting in a very upset child stomping up to her room so eventually as things do in research people begin to notice gaps in the findings surrounding these transactional models and because that's what research is isn't it you ask questions and then you answer them and then you question the answers again and it goes on and on that's research and in this particular case the question was how could we frame things differently perhaps in regards to the role that children play must it always be negative and should we always take that perspective and so in response the concept of mutuality was proposed and essentially what it referred to is an element of a mutually accommodating relationship characterized by shared responsiveness, shared positive affect um, and synchrony. And as you can see from this table, that um, dyadic neutrality has been conceptualized in a number of different ways. And is most often seen as a composite of many elements rather than just a singular static characteristic. And the key thing to note was that through this perspective, children are actively willing partners, meaning that they play a role. They are able to add to the relationship. And so some key questions around dietic neutrality, and these are the ones that I am addressing as well in my PhD. So some examples include, how does dietic neutrality develop? Must it comprise of all the components stated? Or can it just be one or the other? And how does it change over time? I think we've got a question in the chat. Oh, sorry. Right, and so for the sake of time um, and for today's lecture, I'll be focusing on how my PhD is attempting to answer the first question, which is how does dietic neutrality develop? And so at this point, I'm going to talk about the study from which I hope to get answers to the aforementioned questions. And so this is the study that I'm working on for my PhD. It's called the Radio or Not study, and it's a nationwide study. And we have so far about 320 children that are participating from across the UK. We recruit them at ages zero, um, five and six, which is at reception and year one, not zero. Um, and the team is a big one. We have a few primary investigators. So Professor Claire Hughes, who is my supervisor, leads the team. Dr. Rory Devine is from the University of Birmingham. Dr. Elian Fink is at the University of Sussex. And Dr. Hannah D'Souza has just moved to the University of Cardiff and is also with the London's Consortium, as well as the University of Cambridge. So quite a big team. And what the study com comprises of essentially is that we run Zoom sessions with parents and children, and that takes about 45 minutes. We also use a nifty home observation tool. So if you hang on in there and bear with me, I will tell you about it. We have parents answer questions um, and teachers also answer questionnaires. And for this lecture, I'm going to be focusing on the Zoom sessions as well as the home observation tool to answer my question about the development of dieting neutrality. And so here is a list of some of the um, tasks that we do with the children and what we assess during these Zoom visits. So for instance, we ask them how they feel about school. We have a false belief understanding battery to assess theory of mind. Uh, we assess executive functioning through tasks such as fish flanker and a head shoulders, no, a head shoulders knees toes game, which is very confusing as you can tell. Here are some examples of the slides that we use with the children. We try to make it as engaging as possible so that they'll stay with us for 45 minutes. And this is a picture of a child doing her study um, with one of our researchers. So question time. What do you think some challenges might be when trying to conduct research with children? And once again, you can feel free to put it in the chat. I'd love to hear what people think, but if you rather not, and you just want to write it down and make it a little reflective exercise, that's perfectly okay as well. Focus, they'll get bored, maintaining attention, ethical concerns, lack of attention, mm -hmm. attention, attention. Can't explain feelings, can you engage?
Yep. The researcher bias. Mm -hmm. Required to bridge the gap of language, might not understand the task, consent, keeping focus. Yep, you're not their parents, you can't tell them what to do. That's absolutely right, we cannot. Lack of vocabulary, researcher characteristics. Mm -hmm. Yes, these are all really, 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 really good answers. So if people want to scroll through as well and look at what everyone else is saying, um, this is, yep, demand characteristics, demand characteristics. Right. Now these are all extremely valid, and for and they and you and you guys have touched on some of the things that um, I will be bringing up as well. So children may still lack the level of linguistic sophistication to provide an accurate report of their experiences or their feelings, like some of you mentioned, um, and this can make it even more difficult when you're assessing complex constructs such as mutuality. Right, parents may be susceptible to response bias. I think some of you mentioned that as well, be it, uh, be it in answering questionnaires or during interviews. Um, for instance, they might think, you know, right, like some of you said, they might think about what the researcher might want to hear or what the child might want to hear. And another thing is that parents' presence might also influence the child's response. So how do you get about that, right? And so in this study, especially when you come when it comes to uh, studying dyadic mutuality. How do you how do you circumvent these potential limitations? And so in this study, I utilized two core measures that rely heavily on naturalistic observations. And before I tell you the first one, another pop quiz, right? And it may seem a little out left field, but I promise it'll make sense. How many words without googling? How many words do you think we hear in the first three years of our lives? Million, 10K, 1,000 million, 30,000. A lot, <laughs> too many. Too many you count, thousands, 10 million. Right. Billions, millions. And I like the answer that say, I like one of the answers that say too many to count because that's what we'll be talking about later. Three million, quite a few. <laughs> Just a few, dependent on the person, yeah. Right, now, next question. How many conversations do you think occur in the day between a parent and a child? At least, <laughs> it depends, yep, varies from parents. Mm -hmm. 35, not enough. on the age of the child, 230. All right, so the average child in the first three years of their life hears 22 million words. So that comes up to about 20,000 a day on average. And we found that parents and children engage in conversation from anywhere between 225 to 1,163 conversations per day. How do we know this, right? One of you said earlier, too many to count. And that's right, it is too many to count. But the key information that you see here was provided thanks to the LENA technology, which stands for Language Environment Analysis Technology. What does it consist of? It's a small lightweight device and it's worn by the child in a special vest and it's capable of recording to up to 16 hours of the child's naturalistic environment within a six foot radius. So it's a tiny device, but extremely powerful because not just that, not just being able to record, the LENA technology is also capable of providing, and this is an example of what it looks like on a child. The LENA technology is also capable of providing us with automated measures of the child's language environment. Meaning that after I get a device back in the lab and I process it, 
I get a little nifty report looking like thing like this, this document, and it tells you how many adult words the child has heard. It tells you about child vocalizations, how many words the child has spoken, and it even tells you things about the conversational turn count. So that means how many conversations has that child had with an adult. And so for my PhD, I am focusing specifically on the aspect of conversational turn counts, right? Which is when parents and children engage in a conversation well. And so you can see here, for example, I just wanted to let you guys take a look at it because it's very interesting. Um, the Lena device is also capable of parsing apart things like electronic media sounds and such. Now, this is a, this is a rhetorical question. Um, I don't expect you to answer it, but why do you think we might focus on conversational turn counts when we are looking at dyadic mutuality rather than just looking at adult word count or child word count. So the key word again is diet, right? And conversational turn counts have most commonly been used as a proxy for parent-child relationship quality in recent literature due to the back and forth quality of conversational turn counts, right? And given that social interactions have been found to be a core component of early language acquisition and various cognitive skills, researchers propose that parent-child conversations provide the child with opportunities to learn about the social world, to acquire social skills, right? To learn about um, socially acceptable behaviors and such between themselves and the parent, some, sounding something very, very, very akin to dyadic neutrality. Now, the next method, right? of assessing parent-child interactions is something that I like people to give a hand at. But just to recap, the first method of assessing parent-child interactions, I am using global measures of conversational turn counts because of its association um, with the back and forth quality of parent-child interactions. Now for the next one, I'd like people, could I put a, am I able to put a link in the chat if that's, all right. Will people yeah, be able to yeah see of course. Yeah. Or? Drop it in the chat. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing and hopefully people can go to that link. And if you click on, I'm going to share screen so people can see what I'm doing as well. All right. So not sure if people are there, but you can go and try. If not, you can just watch me struggle with this. So we have the parent and child do the Zoom session and we tell them, all right, mom or dad or caregiver, it's time to join the child. And we show them this, we give them this page, we bring it up on their screen and we tell them, right, mom or dad, you can draw lines that go up and down by pressing the O and M keys. And child, you can draw lines that go side to side by pressing the A and D keys. And your job is to try and copy the pictures that you see on the screen. So you see this house and you see this little box, envelope looking thing here as well. And the key thing of this game is that you are not allowed to touch each other's keys. So mom is not allowed to touch child's keys and child is not allowed to touch parents' keys. And so we tell them you have five minutes and you're off. So I'm going to just try and draw one. And so if people are playing with this game as well, if you figured out how to get the diagonal line, feel free to put it in the chat. I am not doing a very good job, am I? But if people are playing, are able to access it, and if you'd like to come back to the chat and tell us how you've gotten on with the game, and if you manage to figure out how to get the diagonal line. Right, I think someone's gotten the, gotten the idea, parent and child will have to press it together to get diagonal. Are people able to see the link in the chat? Oh, it's just to the host and panelists, oh dear. Just realized that people, oh, oh dear, people aren't getting the link. 
Thank you for putting it in, Nina. Sorry, I was too busy playing with it. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have sent it to everyone. Sorry. Sorry, everyone. Okay, do people want to go and have a go? <laughs> All right, if you clicked on the, um, the one that says validated. Okay, I'm going to give myself one more minute to try and see if. Right, I'm not sure if people are engaging with it, like James. Just going to give a couple more minutes and then we'll get back to the material. Right, so if people are still going to edit, feel free, but um, we'll just continue with the next bit of the lecture. So this etch a sketch game, right? How what what do you think would happen if it was a parent and a child attempting this, right? So you've seen that the child can only go left and right, and the parent can go up and down, and then you have that little diagonal line to do, and the key that someone figured out, um, and I'm not sure if other people have figured it out as well, is that you have to actually press it at the same time without good communication, chaos, conflict, yep. If people want to put, you know, what they think might happen during this um, five minutes of being able to, of, of trying to um, copy these pictures. Communication is essential. Parent would overtake, need to communicate, yep, interaction. Sabotage woman. We've had a couple. Child get annoyed, take turns. Mm -hmm. Diagonal concept. That's a very that's a very um interesting point as well about sort of the type of language, the level of language that the child is at. Frustration, impatience, couldn't even. I I mean I I would struggle with it. I do struggle with it still. Yeah, parent would take charge. So yes. So how how do you think that we go as researchers? We go from this five minute interaction to then getting something out of it that we can then analyze, right? So what's that process? So the answer lies in the, the idea of behavioral coding. And so what we're going to do now in a bit is that we're going to try and do some behavioral coding ourselves, okay? But first, I'm going to let you look at the code book. So whenever you want to code for behaviors, you, you will follow a coding system or another, and in our case for the PhD, in my case for the PhD, I am using the parent-child interaction system, which was a coding system designed by Dieter Deckett um, way back in 1997. And it consists of mother codes as well as child codes. And you can see that it's ranked from one to seven. So for instance, if the let's take a look at number three positive affect, all right? So if there was no positive affect displayed, we would rank them at a one. And if they had substantial amounts of positive affect, we rank them at a six, for instance. One or two instances of positive affect, rank them at a two, right? There are more quotes to it, for especially verbalization, um, on task, responsiveness to the child's questions, um, negative affect, and so on. We also have dyadic quotes, and this is the reason why we selected um, the Parkeasy to use as the coding system due to the availability of the dyadic codes, such as reciprocity, conflict, and cooperation. So just bearing these codes in mind, you don't have to remember exactly what each number stands for, right? I'd like us to watch a video again, and we're just going to watch very little of it and just have to pay close attention. Okay, Audrey, we're gonna have special playtime. I'm playing right now. You are playing right now. You can play with any of the toys on this table. You can see you're already smashing the purple Play-Doh on the table. 
I love the way you're just working so hard to smush that purple Play-Doh into a flat pancake. And now you look to be wrapping the pancake around the red block. Audrey, I love how you're paying such close attention to what you're doing with the Play-Doh. And you're putting a little yellow-hatted lady on top of the Play-Doh mound. Stacking Daddy, a yellow block on top Daddy, of the here. She goes on to tall statue that no one can reach. That's a statue, and she goes on top of the statue, and nobody can reach it. What a creative thought, Audrey. I love your statue idea. Right. So now that was a, an example of uh, a parent-child interaction therapy video. So you would expect higher levels of positive affect and so on, right? So this was just um, an example of a, a caregiver and a child interaction. But if I were to ask you, right, on a scale of one to seven, how would you rate the mother's verbalization, right? And so perhaps I would probably rate it at a six because even though she was speaking quite a lot, she wasn't speaking throughout. Right, according to the coding system, the child's verbalization would probably be lower as well. Right? And on a scale of one to seven, how would you rate the mother's positive control? For instance, how much did she engage with the child, encourage the child, scaffold the child's behavior? On a scale of one to seven, how would you rate the child's autonomy? Meaning how much did the child take charge of the game? But one key thing to note, of course, um, is that in these are very different paradigms. So in the etch -a sketch task, they had to share the task and it was challenging. Whereas in the previous video that we saw, they were just building sort of blocks together. But that was just an example and I just wanted people to have some sense of how behavioral coding went. So we addressed this um, earlier um, slightly about what sort of parent-child interaction you would expect this etch -a sketch task to elicit. And a lot of you mentioned more negative emotions or frustration and such. So with that in mind, okay, I would like everyone to put it into the chat the answer to the first one. On a scale of one to seven, what would you expect the parent's verbalization to be when engaging in the etch -a sketch Six, seven, six, seven. Mm -hmm. Six or seven. Yep. So we are all above the average of four, right? Because four. So I know that coding system like the back of my hand now, having coded 260 of videos, but um, this five and six and seven is obviously towards the higher end of things. All right. Now, thinking about this task, on a scale of one to seven, what would you expect parents' positive control to be? Meaning, how much do you think they would scaffold and try and support and encourage the child um, to engage in the task? Four? That's interesting. All right, we've got a seven, we've got some threes. All right. So it's quite interesting. Do you guys, do, 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 do you all notice that? Um, there, there is a tendency towards a certain value or another, depending on the dimension of the parent um, and child's actions. Four to allow the child to think critically as well. Yep, autonomy support. And finally, on a scale of one to seven, what would you expect the child's autonomy to be? One, three, two, two, three, two. Here we have some fours. Mostly twos and threes. Hey. Right. So well done, everyone. You've just engaged in your first behavioral coding um, of the day. And so that's how we create these composite scores, right? Of dyadic neutrality from um, the etch -a sketch task. And so Coming, so coming back to my first question, um, but then again, to just to review, we've established that the second method of assessing parent-child interactions is the behavioral coding of um, dynamic neutrality based on the shared task. So coming back to my first question of how does dynamic neutrality develop, right? We know that conversational turn counts have been related to high quality parent-child interactions, but what do we think the pathway of mechanism might be? 
Do we think that parents and children who have higher dietic mutuality would have more conversational turn counts? Or do we think that parents and children who engage in more conversations would then have higher dietic mutuality? Do we think it's option one or option two? So people can put it in the chat. Um, it's a bit of a trick question, so it's okay if you don't want to put your answers in the chat. Um, all right, we have some twos, twos, twos. All right. Okay, so I think people are starting to cotton on that um, it is, well, in, in Spanish, we say, por qué no los dos, right? So why not both? And that's the beauty of research, which is that you can make calculated, um, you can make calculated decisions about how exactly you want to frame your research hypotheses and your questions and the directionality of um, your proposed associations between variables of interest. So it's common to propose, for instance, comparing the superiority of one or more of two or more models. So for instance, in my PhD, one model might posit that dietic mutuality predicts conversation turn counts, which then confer effects on children's social emotional outcomes. Another model could be that conversational turn counts have a direct link to children's social emotional outcomes, but is mediated by, di by dietic mutuality. So we've come to the end of the lecture, right? And so we, we have established that children do play a large role in their own development. And you've seen how historically we've come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. And so this last question that, you know, may or may not, you, you may or may not have an answer in your mind, but why does it matter that children matter? And so you can, you, can, you can come at that question from perhaps, you know, your own lives or experiences, where perhaps you were, be, you were able to recognize moments where you were starting to gain autonomy. And I know that for myself, that came in the form of my journey through academia. Uh, as mentioned, both my parents never went to college. And when I first expressed my interest to go to college and be a doctor, um, I was told by many people that, well, only doctors' children become doctors. And even at a very young age, I realized that there was some flawed logic to that. And so I continued to pursue my education and apply to various universities. I was rejected by 12 universities the first time I tried. Um, but bearing in mind my agentic role in my development, I, I continued to pursue that. And within research, we also know um, we're starting to realize how influential the child can be, how they can affect not just their environment, but even their own developmental trajectories and such. So these are my references. Um, thank you so very much for your attention and for bearing with all the technical difficulties. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. That was great. Thank you so much. Um, does anybody have um, any questions um, about what we've just listened to and had fun doing? Too much fun, hence why we you didn't all get the link because I was fiddling <laughs> around. Um, someone asks about recording. Yes, you will get a recording of um, the whole day. Uh, it would just be when I have a moment to upload it and edit it all. Um, um, ah, so Dayton would like to know, um, where can I find um, the actual results of the study uh, on the coding scale the, the, I, I'm not sure that's phrased yeah. oddly. do you understand what uh, they're asking yeah so I think the actual results of the study so right now we are current so this is a longitudinal study right and so that means that we have three different ways of collecting the data and so right now the results, if you're looking for them, they are all in encrypted hard drives across the research office because we haven't yet published anything. But, you know, if, if we do publish anything, uh, hopefully um, there'll be some way of um, getting it across to people. We do try to engage with, um, you know, sort of the public on the findings that we get from our study. Great. Um, sorry, let me just... Uh, what would you recommend... Um, 
what books or articles would you recommend if someone wanted to learn more about child development? Ooh, all right. Um, so books, books, books. Right now, I'm just looking at the um, stacks of journal articles that I have and, and not books. But um, if you search up Claire Hughes, um, who is my uh, professor, she's written quite a few on the social lives of children and how they develop an understanding of the social world. So Claire Hughes and Susan Gollenborg as well, who is the, old re um, the previous research director of the CFR. She's written a book called We Are Family, which also touches on um, links between families and children's development. Um, yep. Great. Um, so if someone asked, do the mother codes indicate that only mother-child relationships were measured and observed or measured or observed? An excellent observation. Um, the Parkeasy is just for parents and children. So even though it does say mother code, um, you can also apply that to fathers. And what we tend to do is that we look for potential gender differences as well of the diet. So do parents, do fathers rank differently from mothers along that coding system? Really good question. Um, oh, uh, I think it's Neve. Uh, Neve asks, what are your plans for um, once you complete your PhD? <laughs> oh, dear, is this, uh, I feel like I'm, I'm sitting for an interview. Um, so I'm from Malaysia and um, we are still a very, we are still a developing country. And so especially in the area of child research, if you ask me what my dream was since I was perhaps nine years old, I would tell you that I'd like to set up a national research center for child development in Malaysia. Um, and so that has always been the guiding light of my uh, career and academic trajectory to sort of be able to give back to um, my country and the people who have given so much to me. Good answer. Um, so someone asked, uh, do you think child teacher interactions are just as influential little just as influential in the developmental progress of a child as much as their interactions with parents? I think absolutely, because if you think about it, um, so not to get too much into the weeds, but there is a concept of um, uh, uh, differential susceptibility, meaning that at different stages of their lives, children can be um, sensitive to different forms of influences. And so you would imagine that children who perhaps um, don't have a caregiver role, for instance, in their lives, they would probably be a lot more influenced by the teacher as opposed to a child who is not. So I absolutely believe that um, teachers' roles are extremely important in children's development as well. And the Radio or Not study, research study, actually seeks to combine teachers' and parents' perspectives on children's development. Um, Polly asks, um, why did you choose to research this topic for your PhD? Um, so I was always interested in the child's role, right? I was always interested in the child's role. And at the beginning, when I started, I, was, I, I said, I'm going to study it entirely from the child's perspective. But as we discussed earlier, there are a lot of problems that come with trying to research children. And so this dyadic sort of dance that I could observe was the closest that um, I could get to that at this point. Uh Roshin, I think that's how I say your name, apologies if I said it wrong, um, asks, to what extent do you think the age of parents impacts the development of children? That's a really good question. Um, from what I know, I think age is just one facet of a the diamond of parenting, right? So I think age might have an influence, but then you have to take into consideration so many other factors as well, such as socioeconomic status, for instance, um, we often look at education levels as well. Um, so I think that age does bear an influence, but um, to what extent, I think that's very variable. Um, Katie asks, as part of your study, do you take into account Freud's psychodynamic approach, or is this now completely outdated? Um, I am going to put a disclaimer that I don't think I, uh, I, I, I know as much as I would like about Freud's um, approaches. I think it's extremely convoluted and nuanced. Um, and I, I think that there is a lot to be said about the very early approaches towards psychology. Um, and I think that our responsibility as researchers now is to, um, to, to try and understand where they came from and to also understand where we are trying to go and to figure out how to reconcile that. 
Um, uh, so in your study, did you interview or work with any LGBTQ plus families slash parents? Oh, yes. So um, we I'm trying to look for that question so that I can. Oh, I think it's gone already. Um, so Susan, so earlier there was a talk by Susie Bower Brown, who was with Susan Gollenbach's team. And so their research team focuses more on um, LGB, um, LGBTQIA populations. Um, whereas for our current study, it wasn't a um, inclusion nor exclusion criterion. So I would say that we do have a subset of the population that are LGBTQIA, but I wouldn't say that it's an overwhelming population because our main inclusion criterion was um, children ages five to six and parents signed themselves up, so. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, Nina asks, would you say that um, special educational needs in children impact their reciprocity with uh, parents? That's a hard word, reciprocity. <laughs> yes, um, so um, I think that uh, special educational needs in children definitely um, influence the way in which, you know, not just the way they interact with the world, but the, world, the way the world interacts with them. Um, I think that when you talk about the effect that has on reciprocity, I wouldn't say that it's more or less, I would just say that it might look different. Um, Good question, though. Thank con you. Conscious of uh, of your time. Um, That's okay. I can. I can. I have time. Do you <laughs> if think people have time? I have time. <laughs> do you think uh, the role of the father is just as important as the mother in child development? So Michael Lamb, if you search up Michael Lamb, who is also at the University of Cambridge, he's done a lot of research on the role of father in children's development. Um, it is quite notable that a majority of child development research has relied heavily on mother's reports. And there are a lot of factors that feed into that as well, right? So for instance, if you think about social cultural influences in, for instance, in Malaysia, the mother is commonly the primary caregiver and the father is the one that um, goes off to work. And if you dig, dig a bit deeper, it'll be because of things like maternal leave and allowances and such. So why, so I think that the role of the father is is just as um, worthy of being examined as perhaps any other person's role in child development, including the child. Um, and then we have, um, uh, was your, is the study nationwide and did you find any differences um, in social class or background on child development? Yes, so the study was is nationwide. So initially, fun fact, we tried to start off by recruiting around Cambridge areas Right, um, but then because we all had to go online because of COVID, we tried. We the, the, it became an online Zoom study, and we were able to get children from all over um, the UK. So as of now, to my knowledge, I don't think we've properly examined the links between social um, SES and backgrounds with children's outcomes just yet, as we are still in the middle of collecting data. But like I mentioned, um, hopefully, you know, once we have the results. We can publish a few fun papers um, and you'll be able to get your answers. I'm sorry, I don't have the answers right now. I would love to because that would mean that I'm done with my PhD. <laughs> work, work harder. Come on, these students oh, no. need answers. Oh, I will. Oh, it's because I'm not working. <laughs> um, Eva asks, um, how would a low number of com uh, conversational turn counts affect child development? Mm. So that's that's a really that's a that's a really good question about the role of language in children's um, development. And so some interesting papers that I can think of the top of my head that you might want to look at um, is um, a paper by Sperry and Sperry. <laughs> that it's literally Sperry and Sperry in 2021. Um, there is the Hart and Risley paper, the seminal one in 1963, if I'm not mistaken. That's the paper that first identified that parents who spoke more to their children, eventually they found that there were links with children's educational outcomes, meaning that the more words children heard, right, that, 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 that had some sort of association with their educational outcomes. Of course, this study was way back. And like I mentioned about, you know, our responsibility to understand where researchers back then were coming from. This study was a long time ago. But the idea of, um, you know, Lena and so on was built upon um, this initial study that, that found that they were actually 
effects on children's outcomes, depending on the number of words that they were exposed to. Could you just give them the, the name of the first paper again? They might have missed it. <laughs> Sperry and Sperry. Uh, I could absolutely pull it up right now because I obviously have um, all the, um, the papers at my fingertips. <laughs> I'm ready for a next question while I type in. Oh, okay. Yeah, I still want to distract you. Um, That's okay. I... <laughs> so um, a little bit, we talked about um, class mm -hmm. and gender and how that affects child development. But a couple of people asked about, um, were there any links between or any um, aspects that affected child development with regards to religion and or ethnicity? So that's really interesting. Are you asking specifically in regards to this particular study or are you asking sort of in general? I possibly, I think with regards to this study. Regards to this study. Um, so, so in regards to this study, I don't know if um, we, like I say, I, I, don't, I don't currently have the answer to this study, uh, for this study, but in general, if you're asking about the role of culture, uh, and religion on child development, absolutely. So one thing that you might want to maybe look up is the idea of ethno theories. So E T H no theories, ethno theories, which is basically cultural frames of reference from which uh, through which parents um, interpret children's behavior. Right. So for my uh, for my masters, when I looked at Malaysian mothers ethno theories of children's um, misbehaviors. What was interesting was that they endorsed attributions that had to do with supernatural influences and religious influences that were not endorsed by parents in the US or um, China. So for instance, Malaysian mothers would say, perhaps they were possessed by a demon if they are misbehaving mm. and so on. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, oh, um, so uh, Kian wants to know, um, can the same theories uh, be applied to adults? So perhaps with um, people, so with people like partners or others at work that you would converse a lot with? Oh, so like convers conversational then counts and dining with charity? Yeah. yeah, you could give them a little leader device and make them wear it for, for the day. Um, I, so what's, What's interesting uh, about the idea of dietic neutrality is that it can it absolutely applies to situations where you have more than one person in the interaction, right? Um, and so I'm afraid that I'm not as familiar with um, the adult side of the adult population population side of research, but it would be interesting, wouldn't it, to see if conversational turn counts perhaps confer effects on dietic, um, you know, neutrality between adults, for instance because you would expect that the conversational turn count levels would be vastly different from that of young children with their parents. So very good question. Um, you can, that's an that's a excellent research proposal right there. Um, and then we'll, we'll leave this as the last one because we've already overrun by 10 minutes. So the last Sorry. question, um, someone would like to know, um, would a child from a multilingual household develop differently from others? Uh -huh. <laughs> So this uh, goes into the realm of cognitive psychology and neurolinguistics and all that. And we, it's not my area, um, but I, 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 well, so I'm from a multilingual household. So I can't really tell you if, um, I, I, can't, I can't off the top of my head um, give you any sort of research papers that I'm, I'm familiar with, but the Lina technology has been validated for multiple languages, including Spanish, French, Dutch, um, and currently I'm also working on a study that is an extension of the Radio Not study in Hong Kong and China, and we're seeking to validate the Lina technology as well in uh, for those populations, so that we can, you know, perhaps answer that question um, through through by using the Lina methods. But plenty, plenty, plenty of research out there. Um, on multilingualism and children's development. Great. Thank you so much uh, for this afternoon's talk. Um, yeah, I hope everyone enjoyed it. I, well, I'll say on behalf of everybody um, who's watching, I'll say thank you very much. Um, yeah, really enjoyable. Um, and I'll say thank you so much. Thank you to everyone.